The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hello, everyone. This is the second part in our two-part episode series on the Battle of Saratoga in our larger series on key battles in the Revolutionary War, where we left off British General John Burgoyne, who is known as Gentleman Johnny for a good time with wine, women, and song, who also does not travel lightly in order to support the life of wine, women, and song when he's on the campaign trail, is having a lot of problems in his attempt to cut off New England and sever it so that it can be taken out piecemeal and the British can ultimately win the Revolutionary War. Plan isn't really going according to plan because they try to take a depot, doesn't work, a lot of Hessians are captured, they're moving much slower than they thought they would. Now they're going to come to a head and face a Continental Army. So, James, where are we at with the Battle of Saratoga? So Burgoyne's supplies are continuing to dwindle, the Army's morale is decreasing, you know, they're running out of food, they're getting tired, and they're tired of having to constantly repair bridges and move trees that the Continentals have felled and things like that. Discipline decreased, and Burgoyne's Mohawk allies, we didn't mention them by name, but we did say that he had some Indians with him and they were Mohawks, but they're upset about the lack of plunder. They weren't able to get the booty that they wanted because they hadn't run into the enemy really yet. So, except for the Germans, but the Mohawks weren't with them. So the Mohawks begin to loot farms along the way. <clears throat> they kill the widow of a loyalist, uh, among others. But this widow was named Jane McCrae. And they finally just left the army. They said, we're done with this. <clears throat> uh, the killing of Jane McCrae rallied many continental militiamen to come out and fight. It was used kind of as a propaganda, uh, scoring propaganda points. You know, the British killed this American widow, never mind that the fact the Indians actually killed her. And she was actually the widow of a loyalist. But nevertheless, uh, as we know, propaganda, it's often more about what people perceive and what they feel based on the the spin that's given to a story. That's more important than the actual facts. <laughs> yes, so, absolutely. So as the British army is is dwindling in size we saw that they lost a good chunk of their germans now they've lost their indians they're having other people getting sick uh the american army is actually starting to grow people are coming out from their farms their homes and joining up so burgoyne's teamsters the guys that drove the the animals and the wagons they were also looting farms along the way so the british are not making any friends <laughs> they're going around <laughs> killing uh, civilians and stealing things. Burgoyne wrote uh, later, my communications were at an end. My retreat was insecure. The enemies collected in force and they were strongly posted. But uh, despite this, Burgoyne had repeatedly dislodged rebel forces along the way, just small minor groups that were there to more or less keep an eye on the British. So there seemed to be no need to retreat. Burgoyne could have retreated, and he probably should have at this point, but he, he just thought, well, no, we're the British Army, by golly. <laughs> by Jove! <laughs> by George. Maybe he said by George. Who knows? But That uh, could literally gonna, be the case, yes. Yeah, we're we're professionals, and, and the Continentals, again, are, are just a bunch of amateurs or farmers with guns, so we're going to keep on going. He decided to continue to Albany. On September 13th, Burgoyne and the Army crossed the Hudson to the west side of the Hudson, uh, near the village of Saratoga, and that's where the battle's going to get its name. By this time, Gates, General Gates, the American overall commander, he had 10,000 Continental soldiers, some militia, some regulars. Uh, and Burgoyne didn't know this. Burgoyne, of course, did not know exactly how many of the enemy were waiting for him. Uh, so he's going to have another <laughs> nasty surprise awaiting for him. I'm sure he thought it was quite a few less than that. So that's going to bring us up to the battles. And before we jump into the actual fighting, 
I have to uh, clarify one thing, make one thing clear, and that is that there's not a single Battle of Saratoga, even though we always talk about the Battle of Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga is actually two separate battles that were fought on different days in different locations. Freeman's Farm is one, and then Bemis Heights is the second one. We'll go over those in some detail in a minute, but uh, sometimes they're called the First Battle of Saratoga and the Second Battle of Saratoga. But anyway, I just wanted to make make sure that everybody understands that Saratoga is just the name of a village, but uh, the actual fighting is going to be in two different places. But again, we'll, we'll go with, just like Bunker Hill is misnamed, it should have been Breed's Hill, but why why fight it? <laughs> you know, why, why fight a couple hundred years of tradition? So we'll just continue to call this the Battle of Saratoga Part 1 and Part 2. Okie doke. Ready, Scott? Ready for the bullets to start flying? I think so. I, I'm just interested that for what's happening here, it's almost a, it's like a battle of necessity on the side of the British. It's sort of a reverse of only eight or nine months ago with Washington having to cross the Delaware because he's simply running out of time. So got to give it to the Americans. It took about eight or nine months to get their army back up to what it was before it completely melted away after the New York campaign. The pendulum swings back and forth quite a bit in the Revolutionary War. Yeah, it really does. All right, well, let's do it. So south of Saratoga, the village, north of Albany, there were some there was some high ground called the Bemis Heights. And there, Burgoyne collided with part of Gates' army. And the heights controlled the path southward. Uh, there were heights on one side and the Hudson River on the other side of, of this path. It, it's sometimes called the River Road. This is uh, So they're marching right down alongside the, the Hudson and to their right, the British right, you know, as they're coming down from the north, on the British right are the heights, and on the left is the river. Uh, the Americans were deployed in a redoubt designed by a Polish man, a Polish volunteer who had come over, and, oh, I'm going to butcher this one because I did not think to look this up. Thaddeus Kosciuszko, I believe, okay? And if I mispronounce that, folks... Please forgive me. I'm, I don't know Polish. <laughs> yeah, I, I studied a little bit of Czech a long, long time ago, and they're similar, but not exactly the same. But the fact of the matter, regardless of how his name is pronounced, he had this Polish engineer had designed a very strong position. Burgoyne realized he had to attack it if he were going to continue to Albany. He can't just just march past that and wave to the Americans and say, <laughs> "All right, uh, I don't have a problem with you guys. I'm headed somewhere else. I'm just passing through. No problem, right? Because he would be cut to pieces. Right. Very desperate situation for the British. I wonder with Thaddeus Kosa, Kosa Kuso, how'd you say it? Kosciusko. Kosciusko. I, I, yeah. know, I know Casimir Pulaski because he's more famous, and I live close to Illinois, which did have Casimir Pulaski Day to this day. Are we going to mention it later on, or should we just mention very briefly here the Polish involvement in the Revolutionary War? I don't know that I talk a lot about that. So why don't you go ahead and talk a little? That would be that would be fun. I would, but to be honest, I've forgotten why. So if you know, well, we'll I'm, have to we'll have to do bone up on it a little bit. I mean, they certainly had a significant contribution, but as individuals, I mean, we we've seen, or we're going to see. There's going to be quite a few individual French soldiers come over and volunteer, even before the French jump into the war, as a as a nation. And we're going to see Germans coming on the American side. We've already seen a lot of Germans on the British side. So Poles as well. Yeah, so we'll I, – I haven't looked at that lately. So we'll have to research and return and <laughs> come back on that one. Yeah, listeners, we remember and forget things very quickly. So bear with us as we go on. Um, yeah, we – both of us are constantly researching many different topics at <laughs> one time. So forgive us. Plus, I wrote these notes about six months ago. I have I have – continue to try to stay up on it, but uh, we can't know every single detail about everything. All right. So what does Burgoyne do in defense when he comes up against Gates? All right. So here comes this readout. Um, and Burgoyne divides his army into three columns. The left and center of the British army were to demonstrate before the readout. There's that word again, demonstrate, just to kind of keep them busy. While the right was to, guess what? Go around the side. <laughs> Another flanking maneuver there. Um, they were going to try to march around the side, hit the readout from the side and rear. The British right was commanded by a man named Simon Fraser. Uh, he's a colonel, I believe, at this point. He was. They were surprised along the way by an American force under, guess who, reader? 
or listener. Okay, I think I heard somebody say Benedict Arnold, Scott. So They're Benedict right. Arnold, he's there, and he wants to fight. His blood is up. He had guessed what the British were trying to do. He had persuaded Gates to let him go forward and meet the British attack. Yeah, and we're going to see here that this battle seems to be full of commanders that are led by two people who really don't like each other. So you have Burgoyne and Howe, and you have a similar thing with Gates and Arnold. There's just not much love lost between Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates. The latter is in command of the Continental Forces at Saratoga, and Arnold is his subordinate, but Gates doesn't like having what he considers to be a prima donna in his army. But he did retain Arnold because of his combat reputation, and uh, we're going to see what role that Arnold has later on. Well, it's very interesting. I will not spoil it, but all that to say, yeah. there are commanders on both sides that don't get along, and it, you almost wonder if they're trying to sabotage each other more than the enemy. Yeah, Arnold has already got a chip on his shoulder. He already has been passed over a couple times for Major General. He has a huge ego. Gates has a huge ego, both of them. So this is a recipe for... Uh, problems. I'm not going to say disaster, but it's a re- recipe for problem, a big problem. So for now, they're essentially getting along, but later on, things are going to go south. Arnold deployed Dan- Daniel Morgan's riflemen. We've talked about Daniel Morgan. He was the commander of a group of riflemen, a uh, very effective commander. And they were deployed at a farm that had been owned by John Freeman. So that's where the, the name of this sub-battle uh, it comes from Freeman's Farm, or First Saratoga, but we'll call it Freeman's Farm. They stopped the British assault, but they were themselves pushed back. The riflemen really, again, played a key role in this battle. They picked off a lot of British officers as well as uh, men, a regular enlisted men. And the fighting went back and forth six times, finally until the British disengaged. And so at Freeman's Farm, the British lost 160 killed, 360 wounded, and 40 missing. That's a total of 560 casualties. The Americans lost only half that many. So this is an American victory. And that's significant because these are the Americans going toe-to-toe with the professional British, the hardscrabble patriots that we see at the very beginning of the Revolutionary War that are very ragtag and inexperienced. They're starting to shape it up a little bit because they slug it out with each other. And Arnold holds his ground until sunset before he retires his army in perfect order. So it's a bad omen for Burgoyne, but it also continues to strain the relationship between Arnold and Gates. Gates is jealous of Arnold because he doesn't have the battlefield success that Arnold does. So, yeah, things are. Yeah, Arnold's, great. Arnold's extremely brave, almost to the point of foolhardy uh arnold is a man of action he wants to get out there and you know he's uh swinging his sword and he's on a horse and he's he's just really mr combat and gates is more of a cautious sit back and uh let the army run out there without him kind of guy so yeah that's going to be there's going to be some butting of heads coming up pretty soon uh more soldiers keep arriving so even as the British army is is uh, getting smaller, we've talked about the Mohawk leaving. We've talked about some of the Germans being killed or captured. We, the, people are always getting sick. Uh, some of the British army are just melting away. They're just disappearing, running away, and trying to start a new life. So the British army is shrinking. Even as the American army is growing, the American army, we already talked about how it had been up to 10,000. Now it's going to go even more than 10,000. So, again... As you said, Scott, the Americans showed that they can go toe-to-toe with the British. They can fight off British assaults, even if they hit them six times. (laughs) So now we're going to move on down to Bemis Heights. Are you ready for that? Let's do it. Let's do it. So a courier from Sir Henry Clinton, uh, another one of those major generals that was – he was with Howe at the time in New York City. The courier arrived at Burgoyne's camp. And Clinton offered to send 2,000 men in 10 days. Burgoyne must have said, 10 days? <laughs> Great. <laughs> but again, this is, uh, we have to once again mention that the travel is very slow and that there's not enough roads. So it's not like today when they could just put them on a plane and drop them off like paratroopers or something. They can't do that. So it would take quite a while. But even still, Clinton's force, they started moving, but they were delayed. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> 
And Clinton's force essentially went north a little bit, attacked a few Americans, and returned to New York. So uh, didn't really do a whole lot. All right, it's time to now give Benedict Arnold his due. Let's sketch him out. Let's do a little bit of a mini biography of Benedict Arnold because he's going to play a huge role in this second battle, uh, Bemis Heights. Benedict Arnold was born to a prominent Connecticut family, but unfortunately his father was an alcoholic and he squandered the family's fortune. So Arnold grew up, uh, I'm not going to say in dire poverty, but he certainly was not anywhere near wealthy. When Arnold, Benedict Arnold was 16, he joined a militia force that participated in the French and Indian War. He achieved great success later through the shipping business. And then when the Revolutionary War broke out, he became a captain. He formed his own company. Later, he was appointed a colonel in the Massachusetts militia. And as we've seen already, he's already done a lot of stuff. Uh, he's like the U.S. Army. He's, he does more before 9 a.m. than most people do all day. Right? <laughs> you remember that slogan? Yes. Some of our, list, our older listeners may remember that. But uh, So again, let's just recount what Arnold has done just in the Revolutionary War up to now. Uh, he helped capture Fort Ticonderoga in 1775. Uh, by the way, he spent a great deal of his own money, and a lot of that never got paid back by the government. And that's one reason he's kind of got this chip on his shoulder that's getting bigger and bigger as the war progresses. Then he led the attack on Quebec in 1775 and 1776, which came so close to being successful that it just didn't quite make it. And he was injured in that one, seriously injured in the leg. And then we saw he had stopped the force of Colonel Barry St. Ledger from coming over and reinforcing Burgoyne earlier in 1777. So Arnold had really had an impressive resume up to this point, uh, both in business as well as in war. And he, he felt he, he was really owed a lot. He, he felt he deserved a lot of credit. He was egotistical. He had a mercurial temper so he could go from just furious to calm and then to happy and then to angry. And, and he had trouble getting along with others. He's quarreled with just about every commander he's uh, been paired up with from Ethan Allen all the way down to Gates. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. We all know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday you can't plan for everything and these days it can be tough to plan for anything especially when you unexpectedly lose your job or try to see a doctor about some back pain that flared up when you helped your buddy move but for all of life's unpredictable moments maryland health connection can help you get some peace of mind with low cost or free health plans every plan covers doctor visits mental health services and more get a health plan today at marylandhealthconnection.gov So after the Battle of Freeman's Farm, one evening, this is an interesting anecdote, Benedict Arnold and General Gates talked strategy over dinner. They couldn't stand each other. Arnold called Gates Granny Gates, <laughs> not to his face, of course, but <laughs> behind his back, uh, because Gates Gates wasn't super old, but he looked a lot older than he was, and he wore these spectacles, and, and he was kind of just, I guess, prematurely white-haired and it was very cautious by nature, so the, the name seemed to fit. And the two generals, Arnold and Gates, they had two very different ideas for what to do next. Arnold, based on what I've so told you so far, you will not be surprised to hear that Arnold wanted to attack. That was Arnold, uh, Benedict Arnold's answer to everything, attack. He wanted to attack Burgoyne, but Gates wanted to stay on the defensive. And they got into an argument about it. The argument turned heated, and Arnold exploded in, in, in fury, Gates banished Arnold to his quarters. He said, get out of here. You're relieved of command. So he doesn't make him leave, but basically he, he sends Benedict Arnold to time out, Scott. 
So it's funny. To, Go sit in done. the corner. Yeah. And of course, we know that that's Arnold is not going to go stand in the corner submissively and just say, okay, fine. I'll just stand here while everybody else is fighting. All right. On October 7th, Burgoyne sent a force of 1500 toward the Americans on the Bemis Heights. Gates sent 2400 to oppose him. So already we see the Americans are on high ground and they've, they've got more guys than the British. And then Benedict Arnold in defiance of Gates, defying a direct order to not get involved and, and to just, sit there. Arnold runs out. He takes charge of part of the battlefield without any authority. He just runs out there and takes command. Gates is back at headquarters. Arnold deployed riflemen in the trees and then they fought from cover. So there's those riflemen again. And Arnold starts shouting victory or death. We heard that at the battle of Trenton, which Arnold was not at, but, uh, he thought that was a great slogan. So let's see. It worked one time. Let's use it again. Victory or death. And Arnold led a charge, a brave charge against the attacking British. Meanwhile, uh, Morgan's riflemen picked off officers, including uh, Lieutenant Colonel or Colonel Frazier. I can't remember. He may have been a brigadier. Actually, yeah, I think he was a brigadier general at this point. They, you, you tend to get promoted pretty quickly during war. There's a university in Canada named after him. So that's. Is that right? Yeah. So there you go. I didn't know that. Okay, it's interesting. Fraser got killed, and after he was killed, the British attack really lost a lot of its steam, and they began to retreat. By the way, I got to mention a funny thing about Arnold. Arnold is running around during this attack, and 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 he's going up to riflemen, and he's saying, "Hey, give me your rifle, huh? Give me your rifle, okay?" And he po- would point it and shoot. So I mean, he's just doing every. He's all over the place. He's shooting rifles. He's at certain points on a horse, swinging his sword, Arnold is just the dashing and daring uh, swashbuckling commander. But then he gets shot in the leg. And unfortunately for poor Arnold, <laughs> it's in the exact same place where he had been wounded at Quebec. His femur was broken. Can you imagine how painful that would have been? Ugh. His horse fell, pinning him. Uh, but He was pinned between his horse and the ground, and so he had to have people come rescue him. But meanwhile, uh, the British retreated in full. Burgoyne had bullet holes in his hat and coat, but he wasn't hit, fortunately for him. (laughs) Burgoyne crossed back to the east side of the Hudson. They had been on the west side, but now they go back to the other side, and he begins to move north. But by this time, his army was starving. The food was pretty much gone. By October 11th, 300 of his men had deserted, 300 more. They just fled into the wilderness, and he just can't stop. He's hemorrhaging Hemor- hemorrhaging, I can't say it's got hemorrhaging men. Yes. Uh, they're just going by the hundreds. And so uh, Gates, of course, Gates was the overall commander, and he got credit as the hero of Saratoga. But really, the victory was Arnold. Arnold really, I think, deserves to be given the title, the, the hero of Saratoga. I mean, yes, Gates was an overall command, and the buck stops with him. You know, Gates was pushing the buttons, but. But if Gates had had his way, there would have been no brilliant, brave charge led by Arnold. Arnold would have been sitting in the corner. (laughs) So, you know, it's a good thing for the Americans that Arnold didn't obey orders. (laughs) In this case, he didn't. It was not going to take orders from some stupid granny. Their uh, actions in the battle, it really contrasts their personalities because Arnold is out there doing practically everything. He's like the super fan in an NBA game who's standing up and trying to get hustle the crowd to cheer more, doing everything. Gates never left his tent during the battle. What he did during it was he spent most of the day arguing the merits of the revolution with a captured aid of Burgoyne's in his tent. So he's having a philosophical discussion about the revolution while the battle is going on outside. Yeah, that's, that's a productive to. way to use your time. <laughs> <laughs> but he gets a credit, so say what you will. Okay, so uh, on October 12th, Stark's army, there's John Stark. They had come in from uh, where they had been before. Remember, they had defeated a German force at Bennington in what is now Vermont. But they had marched south, and they're coming in from behind the British. They had 1,000. They crossed the Hudson, and they got behind Burgoyne's force. So Burgoyne is basically surrounded now. He has nowhere to go, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. So Burgoyne... Um, uh, he's not stupid. He, he may be a little bit foolish at times, but 
He sent a messenger to Gates, and they agreed to a ceasefire, and they negotiated for two days. Two days. Hmm. And there's an interesting story because um, I'm a little fuzzy on the details right now. I should have done my homework on this again. And by the way, I based a lot of my notes on a book called 1777. Uh not many people know about this book. There's a there's another book that's very famous called 1776 by David McCullough. It tells the story of the New York campaign and the Battle of uh, Pr- uh, Trenton and Princeton. But 1777 is about Saratoga. And it's a very interesting book because it it takes a day by day, even hour by hour approach. Like each each chapter will say, uh, for example, September 20th. 9 a.m. and then September 20th, 3 p.m. and then September 21st. So it, it's very detailed story. But um, listeners, if I get the, uh, some of the details wrong in this story, forgive me. But there was the British Army. This is before they officially surrendered. But the British Army was just camped, uh, waiting to see what was going to happen. And one of them jumps into the river. And he's going to take a little swim, if I remember the story correctly. And another, an American soldier on the other side of the river sees this British soldier. And they're both Irish, by the way. And the American looks down and he sees this British soldier of Irish uh, origin. And he realizes it's his brother. (laughs) So so they're like, oh, okay, maybe I better not shoot him. (laughs) I'm not going to shoot my brother. And so they had a little family reunion right there in the Hudson River. Um, you know, the, the Civil War, of course, the American Civil War is very famous for being a war of brothers, where literally you had brothers on each side fighting each other. But that's not all that common in the American Revolutionary War. But here it is. It's kind of a cool story where the two brothers are reunited <laughs> on different sides. Anyway, pretty rare in the Revolutionary War. Finally, on October 17th, Burgoyne surrendered his army, which was down to 5,700 at this point. Burgoyne surrendered his sword, but Gates returned it. What a gentleman, aren't they? They're oh, <laughs> such yeah. Such gentlemen. Gentleman Johnny. Burgoyne offered a toast to George Washington. Well, that's pretty nice of a British guy to do. And Gates, in return, being very polite, offered one to George III. All right. Well, I have to give it to Burgoyne because he has failed as a logistician. He's failed as a commander, but as we leave him behind, we're going to see him truly shine because I think he's buttering up gates and he's going to completely outfox him. So he knows how to weasel out of things. It seems like as we're going superpower. And what he does is when gates accedes to nearly all of Burgoyne's demands to articles of convention, not a surrender are signed. So the officers and enlisted men lay down their arms. But by the terms of the convention, the troops weren't prisoners of war, and they're not subject to these rules. These articles of convention state that Burgoyne's troops can march out with the honors of war and lay down their arms on the command of their own officers. Then they'd march to Boston and sail to England on the condition of not serving again in North America unless properly exchanged. But what Gates didn't realize is that the troops could perform garrison duties elsewhere. And this could immediately free up a number of other British and German troops to take their place in America. Washington realizes this, and the convention becomes a matter of dispute. The upshot of the deal Burgoyne had engineered was that his troops, called the Convention Army, were marched to locations including Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Charlottesville, Virginia, and parceled out to farmers as laborers to help compensate for the loss of Americans that were killed and couldn't bring in the harvest. So by the end of the war, most of the officers had been exchanged and many enlisted enlisted men have been allowed to escape and settle on farms in Western Virginia and Pennsylvania. German and British desertions increase as the war goes on. And we see this in the Battle of Saratoga. Burgoyne almost is able to completely outfox Gates. In fact, he did. And if not for Washington, then the victory would not have meant that much in the long run. But they're able to correct it. And the troops are used uh, as labor in that way. So, yeah, old gentleman, Johnny, man, you got to watch him every minute. (laughs) Sneaky guy. All right. So this is a major thing. 5,700 British soldiers have surrendered, you know, or whatever, (laughs) close enough. Basically, they're out of the picture now. Uh, This great plan had uh, to cut off New England and to take control of the Hudson Valley, hopefully rally the loyalists. It all goes to nothing. 
News of the surrender reached England around the end of the month, and the king was in despair. In the House of Lords, William Pitt, who used to be the prime minister, he said, this is Pitt the Elder, he said, no man thinks more highly than I of the virtue and valor of British troops. I know they can achieve anything except impossibilities, and the conquest of English America is an impossibility. You cannot, I venture to say it, you cannot conquer America. What is your present situation there? We do not know the worst, but we know that in three campaigns we've accomplished nothing and have suffered much. Conquest is impossible. So even somebody like William Pitt, who was no spring chicken, he'd, he'd been uh, the pr prime minister, or at least acting prime minister, I believe, during the French and Indian War, during part of it, he'd led the, uh, the British to a, a victory over the French in the French and Indian War. Uh, so he knew what he was talking about. He knew what it was like to run a war. And he just real, he, even he is starting to say, we need to just give it up. And he's not the only one. I just quoted him because he's probably the most famous. He, he's somebody that our listeners will know about. Lord North, the prime minister at this time, asked the king to allow him either to offer peace to the Americans or to accept his resina resignation. The king said, neither one. <laughs> <laughs> I will not accept your resignation uh, I need you to continue uh, leading the government, but we're also not going to offer peace. We're going to keep fighting. All right. George is digging in his heels, but does it pay off? Well, mm, we'll see. The French, uh, meanwhile, before even the battle had even started for a couple of years, the French had been negotiating with the Americans and providing them with supplies secretly using shell corporations and what we would call today shell corporations and just other sneaky means. They had been sneaking in supplies, not a whole lot, but some since 1775. But the French were reluctant to help the Americans at first until they could prove, the Americans could prove, that they were unified and that they could defeat the British. Hmm, this might just do the trick. Huh. Hmm, Congress had sent a delegation to France consisting of John Adams, Silas Dean and Benjamin Franklin to negotiate. And Franklin had gone first and been there by himself quite some time prior to the arrival of Adams and Dean. I think you and I talked about this in a previous episode, Scott. I right. can't remember uh, how Franklin goes over there and he's wearing a fur hat and just really rustic clothing and acting like he's this country guy, this typical American who's a man of the wilderness and all that, which he was nothing of the kind. No, but, not at all. He lived in a city his entire life. Yeah, and, and he went over there and he uh, charmed the women, the older women. He's, he's a very old man at this point. He's almost 70. He, in fact, he turned 70 in 1776, and his French is not that good. But nevertheless, the French, the people of Paris just fall in love with him, and so he's negotiating with them and Adams joins him and this other fellow, Silas Dean. And finally, this victory, this American victory, major victory, basically wiped a complete British army off the map, gone, uh, at least seemingly. The American victory at Saratoga, it motivated France to finally take the plunge. So France agrees to sign a treaty of alliance and assistance with the United States. This is huge, Scott. We cannot overemphasize how important this is. The Americans now have an ally, probably the second best Navy in the world, second or possibly first, the, the, the best army, a very good army, professional French army. They're going to come in on this side of the Americans. Now they're going to take forever, but <laughs> it's going to be very frustrating to the Americans, but at least they are going to help officially now, not sneaky stuff, but actually sending over ships and men and lots of guns. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. We all know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday lucky land casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky lucky in line at the deli i guess aha in my dentist's office 
More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. So this completely changes the nature of the war. It turns a colonial rebellion into a world war. And that's something we need to really stress, I think, Scott, because prior to this, it was just uh, British versus British colonists, right? It was just a kind of a local thing, a little rebellion in North America that grew to a big rebellion. But now it's France versus Britain all over again. And the French, they've really been kind of looking forward to an opportunity to get revenge on the British for kicking them out of North America and defeating them in the French and Indian War. They, the French have a huge chip on their shoulder against the British, and they're ready to uh, deal out some payback. And now the British have to watch out for the French all over the world, literally. Um, for example, how do they know the French might not try to invade Britain? They might cross the English Channel and land in uh, in, in Great Britain. It, it's possible. I mean, it, it would be very difficult, but it's certainly possible. So they have to now put some forces in the English Channel to make sure we don't have a, a redo of William the Conqueror. <laughs> uh, they've got to watch out now in the West Indies. There, that, there's always a big rivalry, rivalry between France and Britain in the West Indies. Uh, other parts of the world, uh, India, uh, the, you know, the far East, there's all kinds of places where fighting is now going to break out as well as Europe, continental Europe. So now the British are going to have to start spreading out their forces a little more, a lot more than they did before. And so for this reason, for the reason that Saratoga is leads directly to the intervention of the French on the side of the American Saratoga is considered to be the turning point of the war. Now, Scott and I talked in our Civil War series about turning points, and we came to the conclusion that there wasn't a single turning point. You know, used to when right. I was in school, they said, oh, Gettysburg was the turning point of the war and all that. But no, it wasn't. But this it's hard to argue against this. It's hard to argue that Saratoga was not a turning point. I mean, it's, I'm sure you could make that argument, but I can't think of another moment where things change so quickly. You know, you went from, again, just being a colonial, uh, an internecine struggle between British and other British. Now the French are involved. So it's really a, a world war. The French are going to end up really helping the Americans not to give too much away. Right. This is something that it, it can't be overstated how important it is. And when we talked earlier about the Seven Years War, people typically mention the French and Indian War to set up the Revolutionary War. But that was just the North American theater of the global war that's happening. And this can be considered almost an extension of the Seven Years' War, where these fault lines between the French and the British that are still there, the French are trying to exploit. And if you remember from our Civil War series, we mentioned that the Confederates really took a lot of cues from the Revolutionary War. They thought this is a battle that is starting as a civil war, which you could consider the Revolutionary War to be that because it's British colonists, British subjects of the British Empire fighting the British. And the Confederates thought, well, let's win a resounding battle. If we win a resounding battle, we could get foreign support, probably from England, much in the way that the Americans got foreign support from the French when they proved their mettle. So this is at least the Confederate blueprint using the Revolutionary War to try to win. Yep, this definitely sets the standard and gives hope to the later rebels, the other rebels that we talked about in our previous series. One other thing I want to mention that I think is just kind of interesting, kind of side note here. After the Battle of Saratoga, a new United States flag debuted. Before this, the U.S. flag was the – it was essentially the flag of the U.K., the, the United Kingdom or British flag in the top left corner – and then the 13 stripes. But after this, they figure, oh, let's get rid of the British flag. <laughs> We're not British anymore. We're different. So they unveil the famous flag, which has actually been in the news lately. There's been some controversy. Yeah. It, which is, it's hard to imagine. I, I don't get that. But anyway, I don't want to get into politics, but uh, – by the way, we're recording this in July of 2019. Who knows when people will be listening to this, Scott, but um, just to give a little context to that. 
This new flag has 13 red and white stripes, as the previous one did, but instead of the British flag in the top left corner, there's a circular pattern of 13 stars, one star for each colony. That's in the upper left-hand corner. So there you go. What do you think, Scott? Well, this is uh, an interesting story about the Betsy Ross flag, because if you look at her page on Wikipedia, there's a famous painting where she and assistant are holding up the flag in front of George Washington, and Washington is standing with the noble erect posture that he had when he was on that boat crossing the Delaware River. Yeah. Great painting. Again, not at all like anything that happened. Uh, Betsy Ross, there are many questions about how involved she was in the design of this flag because the sources that we have about her involvement aren't that solid. Now, just a little bit of background about her. She is an upholster in Philadelphia. She is a Quaker and an abolitionist. That brings some irony to this kerfuffle in July 2019 that we have. And Pennsylvania was uh, an abolitionist state when it entered the Union anyway. But she produced uniforms, tents, and flags for continental forces, and she represents the contribution of women in America. The questions about her involvement in the design of the flag are that the National Museum of American History notes that the story of her making the flag practically single-handedly, it came in the 1876 Centennial Exposition celebrations when Ross's grandson, William Canby presented a paper to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania where he claims that his grandmother had made with her hands the first flag of the United States. And Canby says that he first obtained this information from his aunt uh, Clarissa Wilson in 1857, 20 years after Betsy Ross dies. So in his account, the original flag was made in June 1776 when a small committee, including George Washington and Robert Morris and relative George Ross, visited Betsy Ross and discussed the need for a new American flag. Um, this this story is a little bit fantastical. It's almost like um, in Napoleon Hill's book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, written in the 1920s, Napoleon Hill is, was a bit of a huckster, and he basically made up the story where he's talking with uh, President Wilson right after the conclusion of World War I, and Wilson is saying, what am I going to do, Napoleon? As if like Napoleon Hill is giving direct advice to the commander in chief about global affairs following the conclusion of the great war. And this story of Betsy Ross kind of smacks of that too, where, you know, the commander in chief right in the middle of the war, go to her upholstery shop and um, commission personally for her a flag design. And then the story goes that she accepts the job. She alters the committee's design by replacing six pointed stars with five pointed stars. Um, but we don't have we don't have any proof of this. Um, what we do know is that she was one of several flag makers in Philadelphia, and her contribution does seem to be changing six pointed stars to the easier to design five pointed stars, not so much symbolic. So I don't. I one more thing, James. This kind of seems to be a running motif here. This is a question of historiography of how history is made. And it seems like a lot of the romantic elements of the Revolutionary War of Nathan Hale stating, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. One of the commanders shouting victory or death and these very noble, larger than life things of Betsy Ross making the flag. They seem to be coming out in the 19th century, specifically after the Civil War. I don't know if it's a patriotic project of uniting the United States or it's adding kind of a heroic gloss over them. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know the details or the history or historiographical argument. Do you know much about this, about how these kind of embellishments of, I cannot tell a lie. George Washington, you know, chops down a cherry tree, but can't lie. Is this part of the 19th century or what's this all about? I think it's nation building through, through myth making. You know, I, I think now the, the whole thing, the, I cannot tell a lie and the chopping down the cherry tree and all that, for, that, that was much earlier. That was in the, I think the 1820s, 30s. It was, it was from a biography by uh, a parson or a pastor, uh, Mason Weems. And I, the other things, I'm not really sure about the exact dates when the legend of Betsy Ross came up, but all these, as you mentioned, were, were much later than the revolutionary war. And it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of this uh, was really, if not invented, if it was really talked up and and kind of solidified into American sacred tradition around the centennial. You know, think about 1876, the 
Reconstruction was coming to an end. The Civil War had been over for quite a while. And I think a lot of people did want to bind the nation together to some extent. And and so I think this could play a big role in that. I mean, why not? Let's talk about the revolution instead of the Civil War. Yeah, that's a pro tip for listeners. If you're wondering where a lot of myths come from, look at when was the time when a lot of the histories were written about a specific time. Uh So, for example, I mean, just to take something completely different, a lot of medieval history is distorted because it's looked at through the prism of the Victorian era when a lot of medieval works are being made. And ideas about medievals thinking that the world was flat, a lot of it comes from anti-Catholic Protestant dogma of the 19th century and proper medieval ladies who wear their um, henin, their traffic cone hat and look wistfully out the window their manners are based on a Victorian lady. So a lot of the myth-making in the Middle Ages comes because many of these works come from the Victorian era. And like you said, James, many of these works come from the centennial. So there is that element that's kind of glossed over. So the the way that history is sort of flattened and mythologized can come due to historiographical considerations like this. So anyway, that's my academic uh, fancy pat- pants little segue there. But uh, yeah, I think this brings us to a close. Anything else on Saratoga? No, we've put Saratoga to bed. It's it's a great fun battle to talk about. It's it's obviously if you're an American, it's it's you it's a lot of fun to it's fun because we win. You know, we win overwhelmingly and um and of course it's going to bring in the French, which is going to make the Americans situation even better. So next time we're going to talk about what is George Washington and what are General William Howe doing while all this is going on? Uh, they were not involved in this, of course. This occurred far to the north. General Howe is still in New York City. But as we saw earlier, uh, we <laughs> Burgoyne wanted him to come up and help him uh, near Albany. But instead, Howe had his own idea and Howe decided he was going to go take Philadelphia, which is the rebel capital. And maybe that would bring the war to an end. So we're going to look at his effort to do that. In a sidetrack episode, we're going to look at three battles that don't really count in our count of the 10 key battles, but they are important and worthy of mention. And they're going to all revolve around House moving to Philadelphia and then his eventual decision to leave Philadelphia. And we're going to see how Washington's going to try to uh, frustrate his plans. All right. Well, this Saratoga was battle six in our 10 key battles. So we're going to keep moving on in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com, where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of Madeira and raise a toast to liberty. Liberty.